this time of the year feels very full. It's kind of weighty time of the year. You know, from a religious perspective, December's kind of a packed month. We have Advent and Christmas, we have Hanukkah, we have Yule or winter solstice, um, and we have uh, Rohatsu, right? All of you doing Rohatsu. No. <laughs> um, Buddha's Enlightenment Day. Two days ago, he got enlightenment 2,500 years ago. So they say. <laughs> so this weekend, faithful from around the world will gather, honor the Buddha for waking up, really. Uh, it's the day that he got what's called, what we shorthand for, enlightenment, which is really kind of a funny word because I'm not really sure uh, you know, what it means. Um, people say it all the time, but it just sort of feels a little bit mysterious, a little bit opaque. Like, what, enlightenment? And to be clear, the Buddhists, they, they love their embellishment. Like, if you've read the sutras, uh, they, are, they border on preposterous. <laughs> They are so full of, like, uh, outlandish stories. They're outsized and wild, and they're, they're almost... It's like reading a cartoon. It's like reading a comic book. They're just cartoonish in that way. You know? But I don't think that they're intent to be read literally. Uh, that said, I do think that it's important to use a discerning lens with these stories so that we can see uh, where they've been enhanced for lyrical purposes and where they're speaking directly about the truth of our lives. Now, I've heard, I, I'm sure that you've heard a lot of things about the Buddha, uh, but just to make sure that we're on the same page. Uh, the Buddha was born a prince, uh, and he lived the life that you might imagine every prince lives. Uh, every desire of his was fulfilled. He married the most beautiful woman in the kingdom. They had a beautiful child. And then all of a sudden, his life came crashing down around him because he went out for a chariot ride with his attendant. And on this chariot ride, he saw an old man. And it shook him. And the next day, they went out for a chariot ride, and he saw a sick man. And that was really hard for him. And then on the third day, he saw a dead body. And his father, the king, had sheltered him to such a degree he'd never encountered aging, sickness, and death. And these revelations completely up, upended his understanding of the world, and, and he became consumed with this question, you know, what is this life? What is this life? And so he abandoned his comfortable palace and his wife and his child, and he went to live in the forest with the great meditation teachers of the day so that he could learn the meaning of life. And he was a skilled student, and so when he mastered a certain style, he would move on to the next teacher, and, and soon he had, he had mastered all the styles around him. And so he, was, he just dedicated his life to, to asceticism. He lived as an ascetic, a, a celibate who performed all types of, of ritual pain and deprivations uh, to try to tame, to, 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 to uh, control the desires of, of the mind and the body. But after many years of hard training, the, the Buddha was essentially defeated. That, this is not how the story goes, but this is, my, this is Ian's, Ian's criminal. <laughs> the Buddha was essentially defeated, right? The path of asceticism was not working. It, it could not answer the burning question of like, what is the meaning of this life? But he also knew that going back to the, to the castle and the rich foods and all of that, which, which filled with the illusions, um, th that also wasn't going to work. So he was stuck, right? And his decision was to sit down beneath the Bodhi tree, and he vowed not to get up until he awakened. Now, there's no official Buddhist canon, <laughs> despite what certain schools tell you. Uh, so the stories kind of vary from school to school. But in this part of the story, they all kind of paint him in, in a similar way, which is he sat down with complete resolve and determination. 
But I imagine that he sat down that night under the Bodhi tree a broken man. Yeah, I know. That's not the story. But I do. I, I see him sitting down underneath the Bodhi tree, bottoming out on his ego. Right? He had mastered every style of meditation. He had done every form of ritual torture and deprivation and, and the, the, the images of him at this stage in his life is of a, a person, you can see his ribs, he, he's emaciated. He, he had wasted away performing these extreme acts of physical denial. Right? He channeled his willpower so completely that he'd conquered the realm of human discipline. But, but this had not given him, the re, given him the relief that he sought. And, you know, when I, I think about this stage in him, I, I remember a, a, a quote, not a quote, but a, something a Zen master once said to me, a Josh Bartok once said, he said, we all start meditating for the wrong reasons, which of course is a little bit cheeky, right? Because uh, whatever, there's no wrong reason to start meditating. If you haven't started and you're thinking about doing it, just go ahead and start. There's no wrong reason. Please, just start. But what, what Josh was pointing to is that when you experience how interwoven life really is and how ephemeral the, this individual identity is, like how ephemeral my fame and my, like all of the, the material I accumulate in my life, how ephemeral that is, you, you start to see that the, the motivation for meditating actually shifts from practicing for what I can get to uh, practicing for all of life. Right? So even in this way, the Buddha was practicing for the so-called wrong reasons because he thought he was going, he was trying to get something for himself. He was trying to get relief for himself. But his ego still desired. Right? Truly, some of the greatest practitioners are people with the strongest willpower, the strongest need for relief from their own ego. But regardless of the differing details of the story, that night the Buddha surrendered. He just let go. He's like, this is not working. Also, this is not working. <sighs> and he just let go. He could no more stick a burning poker on his skin than he could return to his beautiful wife and rich food. His ego was defeated. Just like, <laughs> so silly. He sat down and he let go and the whole universe opened up. The animals and the birds and the gods came forward with flowers and perfumes and they anointed him. And the 10,000 worlds opened up and heavenly choirs proclaimed his act of redemption for the whole universe. And at this point, you know, the story gets quite grand, right? But the more important part to remember is that he let go of trying to use all of this hard work and practice to get something, to grasp something for himself. As often is the case, right? Great success comes with even greater challenge. So he releases, the star appears, he releases. And perhaps sort of incensed that someone could escape the allurement of ambition and appetite, Mara, the demon of death, rebirth, and desire, rode up on an elephant carrying weapons in his 1,000 hands, surrounded by a fearsome army that extended for 12 leagues in every direction. They, they do know how to write an embellished story. And they attacked with wind and rocks and thunder and fire and swords and, and burning coals and whipping sands and darkness. And everything that they hurled at the Buddha was transformed by the loving universe into anointments. And then Mara was like, okay, that's all right. New strategy. He sent in his three daughters who were named desire, pining, and lust, 
which is, you know, I don't recommend those. <laughs> Casey, don't choose that name. Right? Like, and, they, and they were each surrounded by voluptuous attendants to seduce the Buddha. Uh, but he was not enticed. He, his surrender was so great that he'd released all wanting for himself. And, you know, infuriated, Mara commanded mountaintops, the very earth, to, to fly off and crush him. But the, the Buddha, and you've probably seen it, is called the Earth Mudra. He's, you, if the statue, you'll, you'll see him touching the earth with two fingers. Just touched the earth. And the earth responded with a hundred thousand roars, so loud and so powerful that the very elephant that Mara was riding on kneeled before the Buddha in respect and the army scattered. Now, you can read this as a supernatural battle with demons, but I understand it as a metaphor for the internal struggle. Sometimes the compulsions that we experience, whether they are for fame or sex or material or even death, can feel so overwhelming that it, it feels like we are trying to fight off an army of demons. And it's only when we know that the whole universe has our back that we are able to steer clear of these compulsive desires. Now, there's a parallel in the Christian tradition. Right? To prepare himself for his great surrender, Jesus went into the desert for 40 days where he performed all sorts of physical deprivations and denials of, to prepare himself for his release. Right? And for me, the Christian story gets a little muddled here because um, when you're making him a god, it, it sort of it takes out the, the fact that he had to sit, it really sit with his own attachment, right? Because how do you have a God that has attachment? For me, he wasn't a God. He was a man staring down his desires for his body, for, for his life, for his, his fame even, maybe. He knew, perhaps, that he was going to die and needed to let go of his body. But maybe that wasn't all that was he was wrestling with. Maybe the deeper he embraced the path of teaching, he saw that actually what, he's, what was there was that we do this to live for one another. Jesus realized that he was still attached uh, himself, to himself. And to continue to teach, he had to release at a greater level. You know, one of my, my favorite phrases, just you know, for talking and here, it's, you'll hear me say it is, you know, you cannot give away what you do not have. You cannot give away what you do not have. So, although people try, right? This is why ministers and, and other religious leaders have to do, we have to do our own spiritual work. We have to go sit retreat ourselves. We have to, uh, it's, not, it's, more, it's not just enough to read books. Like, we have to go stare into the, the face of Mara Right? So that we're able to talk about it from an authentic place. If I'm not trying to release, then all I have up here uh, to offer are my thoughts, my opinions on things, right? which aren't uh, honestly <laughs> very good. If you could hear what goes on inside of my head, you would be saying, we made a terrible mistake hiring this guy. Which, you know, maybe you're saying that anyway. But like... Uh, <laughs> You know, the compulsive desires of my thinking are always about me, right? Am I getting what I want out of the situation? And religious training with surrender helps me recognize that I am interwoven with all of you, that truly my safety and fulfillment are intimately tied to your safety and fulfillment. So in the desert, Jesus faced the devil. Some translations uh, say that he faced something called the adversary, which, honestly, I like a little more because that's how I think of the voice that's trying to get me to live in a smaller, more selfish life. It's the adversary of the fulfilling life because fulfillment doesn't come from getting my desires fulfilled, right? I, I, I read this story last night where these two millionaires on the island of Dominica, 
were fighting over an access road. And one of them killed the other one and his wife. These are people with so much money, they own huge plantation plots in a Caribbean island, and they don't have enough in their hearts and in their beings to, to have an access road that crosses one of them. So much that they have to kill another person, right? Getting all that you desire does not relieve you from actually getting what you want. Fulfillment does not come from having your desires met. Uh, this is not to say we should live, you know, in power. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there is something deeper that is actually about fulfillment. And you have to stare down the adversary. You, you have to go into the desert and, 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 and see the devil. You have to see Mara riding on the elephant. The devil promised Jesus material in the form of bread, but that's just a, a stand-in, right, for anything material. Uh, he said, oh, throw yourself off. God will rescue you. That's, that's just like you'll live forever. That's, you're fine. You'll live forever. And then, of course, the, the kingdoms of the world will bound to, bound to you. That's just fame, right? All, the, you, each one of us is dealing with these things on some level. It can happen, just fame, like out here, this coffee is so amazing this morning. Oh, you know, the other people make terrible coffee. I am the famous one for the good coffee here. <laughs> like, it, it doesn't matter the level. It happens often subtly. Now, the, the stories that we read in these texts, they're often outsized in their embellishment, but we can feel it when we're overwhelmed. You know, we love these great stories of these people who were able to stare directly into their desires and say, no, you know, not today, Satan, which is such a great line. <laughs> but truly, no, because in their stories, we find hope for ourselves, right? That maybe we too can also say no. So after the defeat of Mara, the demon of death, rebirth, and desire, the Buddha sat for a few more weeks in this completely liberated state. Shorthand, we call it nirvana, right? Who knows what that means, but just liberated state. And he was existing in union with all that surrounded him, with the cosmos. And uh, when it rained, like, there was so much bonding between him and, and creation. When it rained, snails climbed up on his head, it, it covered his head. So when you, when you see those statues of the Buddha with those little bumps on his head, that's not his hair. Those are snails that he sat in meditation as they climbed up his body and covered his head, which is disgusting. <laughs> but the universe was feeling, so, was responding with so much compassion for him that they wanted to keep him dry, right? And so they were there to allow him to meditate in the rain. It's a silly story, but what it's talking about is this is the extreme of the interwoven life. But now we get to the most important part of the story, at least for our purposes, and I know that it's kind of taken us a while to get here, but for me, this is the most important part. The Buddha had achieved the supreme enlightenment of the 10,000 worlds. He'd turned every desire and suffering into flowers. Demons bowed down before him. And it was such a great awakening that the god Brahma was amazed and came down from the heavens and asked the Buddha, to go out into the world and teach the humans and the gods what he'd learned. And the Buddha said, no. The Buddha said no. Which is wild, because, you know, how often do you get to see Brahma? And um, I don't know how often you get to say no to Brahma. But he said no. He said no, I can't. They won't understand. And how am I supposed to teach people to awaken anyway? I'm just going to sit here. The person that had achieved the supreme awakening still had a voice in his human head that said, that's too tough. No. 
And this is, you know, where I identify with the story. <laughs> you know, it's hard for me to identify with fighting off the demon of death and rebirth and desire uh, and the, the voluptuous daughters of pining and, you know, with just my, like, surrender. I want to do that, but I still live with the desires for the material world and, and my body and my fame, you know? But I can really identify with the voice that says, no, I can't. Even when there's a tremendous amount of pain, right, that I'm suffering with, <laughs> and I can see a path laid out, all I have to do is just let it go. That voice often kicks in. Sometimes it's loud. Sometimes it is very soft. Oh, that's too tough. I can't. Right? Now, some of us are better at ignoring this voice. The Buddha was so great that he's able to face armies 12 leagues wide, 12 leagues deep. Right? He's on the extreme. Most of us are on the other extreme. But even the Buddha got stuck because he thought his real task was waking up. He thought what he, was supposed to, what he was supposed to do with his life was transcend it. And that's not what he's supposed to do with his life. His real task was to teach the world. He didn't flinch when he became enlightened. He woke up, witnessed the horror and the joy, and was at peace with it all. But when he was asked to teach the world, he became paralyzed and said no. And I love this story because it frames why we engage in all of the practices that we do. We may all start meditating, or we may all go to church for the wrong reasons when we start. Right? We think that we're going to get something. And honestly, that's how the world programs us. It's not, it's not a problem. You know, why would I volunteer for nursery or RE? Like, I'm not going to get anything if I do that. I want to get the sermon, or I want the music, or the candles. And, and that happens in this room. You know, I'm not going to get the thing that I want if I'm over in the nursery. You know, I made a, a, a joke uh, last week. I, all the weeks blend together, but I think it was last week. And I was like, oh, my words are garbage. And some of you wrote in very nice things saying, no, no, they're not garbage. They were really quite nice. And, um, and as I was reading those really lovely letters, you know, Mara was sitting on this shoulder and the adversary was sitting on this shoulder and they're like, Ian, your sermons are awesome. <laughs> and I was like, you're right. I worked really hard on these and a lot of people, I, I hope a lot of people come to hear me speak and, and I hope this ch church goes really famous and by that I mean I hope I'm really famous. <laughs> right? The adversary and Mara, boy, they, know, they have my number all the way. And they say the sweetest things to me. And sometimes they say really terrible things. Like, Ian, you're a fraud. You, you this is, the, you know, you should go become a stockbroker. You don't have any skill here. Like, they, they say terrible things. So it really depends on the day. But look, it's not that my words are garbage or, or that they're not garbage. You know, I want to rephrase what I said the other week. It's not that they're garbage or not. It doesn't matter, actually. But I can't give you what you're looking for. I can't. I can be with you. We can companion one another. We can say that we're on this journey together. We can commit, we can dedicate ourselves to one another. But ultimately, there's no one sitting with you when you are staring into the face of Mara. I can hold your hand, but you've got to stare in there. You've got to hold my hand as I, I stare. That's why we're here, to help one another, to teach one another what the wisdom that has been given to us from who knows where, the cosmos, I guess, right? The spiritual connection we're looking for, it can't be attained or grasped or held, right? 
if we hear the right words, we hear the right practices, we get the right money, that's just, that's not, it's, it's not going to last. So the story reminds us that we seek to awaken not for ourselves, but for those who are lost and lonely. I do this work for those who still haven't heard that there is, a, there is relief. There is relief from the voice of Mara, from the voice of the adversary. When we perform the religious practices solely for ourselves, we end up living within walls, walls of our own making, walls that actually hold fast to resentments of the past, walls that contain anxiety about the future. And we seek liberation from these walls, not only to make our lives better, but our calling really is to make the world better. You know, if the Buddha just stayed sitting on his cushion in nirvana, it would have evaporated because you cannot hold on to it. And he would have gone crazy. So despite the fact that he thought awakening could not be taught, he was like, fine. He probably swore, got up. I don't know if he swore. But, you know, he was like, he got up. He got up from his cushion and he found his first four disciples, spurred on, you know, only by the desire to give away what had been given to him by the universe. And over time, those four became millions. And over time, the 12 that walked with Jesus became billions. And, you know, we may have some critique on how these people interpret the stories, but the lessons really are there for us, right? You will be faced by Mara or the adversary. And when you are, what will you do? How have you prepared? This is the fine line that religions try to tread. Hearing what you are called to do with this one precious life means stepping out beyond the limitations of your own best thinking, which often includes things like, no, I can't. You know, Mark was sick. He called Steve this morning, and he's like, Steve, please, lead the choir. And Steve was like, yeah. <laughs> but he said, okay. Because someone had given him enough that he could give it away today. You know, I, I shout out his name, so he gets a little fame, he gets, but that's not why he stepped up. He stepped up to give it away. I don't know if that's why he gave it, but that's the story I tell. Right? So when we step out beyond our limitations, like we're going to hear these words like, no, I can't, think of your responsibilities. What will other people think of you? That's a great one. What's in it for me? But listening to our call, not just as individuals, but as a congregation, means saying yes and trusting that there is a greater purpose for us. Not just, I get less anxiety. That's good. Please, let's do that. But also, there's more. All of the great religious traditions tell us the same thing, that passing beyond the void of the unknown we encounter a place of abundance. Not for us, it's just abundant. But there is a threshold that we have to walk through, and that threshold is called fear. And we must pass through the threshold if we're going to enter the place of abundance. You know, our journey is not about deprivation. The Buddha tried that, it did not work. It's not about attainment. That just turns into gluttony. Our journey, the same journey walked by the Buddha and the same journey walked by Jesus is about the release of the two extremes. Each of us is going to walk this journey in our own way. But our release is not the final step. The final step is giving away what was given to us from whatever. The great stories make it seem like the Buddha and Jesus sort of faced their demons and defeated them so completely that they never returned, right? The demons don't appear again in the stories, and 
but I don't think that they disappeared entirely, right? The Buddha had to check himself with his practice. He sat months of meditation every year just to keep his teaching clear. He knew that he couldn't, like, stop meditating. Awakening is not a stable state, which it's so funny, like, know, knowing a bunch of, I, I know a bunch of Zen masters. Uh, some of them meditate more than others, and I will tell you, some of them are clearer than others, right? Awakening is not a stable state. You have to practice forever. And Jesus, if he'd lived longer, I'm sure that he would have returned to the desert over and over again, just so he could keep his focus on his students. Because I'm sure many of them said his sermons were great. That's a joke. <laughs> his sermons were great, but he couldn't let that go to his head, right? Because then it becomes about him. He might become a megachurch preacher. And no one would know his name. Right? Because the attainment of the megachurch is ephemeral. It's going to die. And that's not the message of liberation. Most people who are committed to the message of liberation, are their, no one knows their name. The megachurch, whatever. It's, all, it's a seductive thing to hear especially when we are pale shadows of the Buddha or Jesus, right? They, but they did not have special powers. They were just like you and me. They lived with a voice that said, no, I can't, just like you and me. But when it came time, they got up from the cushion so they could help someone else. They used their agency, their power, not to elevate their status, but to help another person experienced liberation. This is the final expression of generosity and gratitude. We become willing so that we can give hope. 